please welcome Captain Jason Weed. Good morning. So before we discuss the challenges moving the unmanned undersea enterprise forward, I think it's important to cover a small period of our Navy's history. Um, it was a period when we observed an emerging technology. We invested early uh, to determine how it might be beneficial to the Navy. And to the surprise of some of you, I won't be talking about submarine force history. So in 1910 and 1911, the US Navy embarked on a journey and discovery of investment that will ultimately enable the United States to become the preeminent sea power at a global scale that was never seen before in human history. The ability to export naval air power forever changed diplomacy on the high seas. In early 1910, Captain Washington Irvin Chambers was charged to observe everything that will be of use in the study of aviation and the influence upon naval warfare. November, November 10th, uh, 1910, the Secretary of War, Dickinson, observed what was going on uh, and he said there are going to be great possibilities in the use of naval air power for observation and bombing. They've never been sufficiently discovered or investigated by the War Department, but his intention was to invest in five and potentially ten aircraft so that way we could discover what might be possible in naval aviation. He can't predict what would happen and the, what the appropriation, but he was very, very positive about what might happen. But his key was the United States must not be outstripped by other nations. And the only way to determine whether flying machines in a time of war will be serviceable or not is to experiment. Then four days later, Eugene Eli took off from the USS Birmingham from the first launch from a ship. In January, Eli landed on and then took off from the USS Pennsylvania. So, you know, massive changes in the way that people thought about the use of the airplane. In May 8th, Captain Chambers procured the first uh, aircraft for the United States Navy and forever changed naval aviation and changed the way fundamentally that wars were fought on the high seas. Aviators quickly developed new capabilities and tested those and they were still in place today. But don't be misinformed, it didn't come without risk, it didn't come without cost. Many aviators played, paid the ultimate price in testing out these new capabilities. But with any creative effort, failure is a critical part of learning. Today we find ourselves at the precipice in our decision making for our unmanned systems. Aircraft carriers and fast attack submarines, our capital assets are aging, and replacement costs are estimated to be in the 13 to $6 billion range for the aircraft carrier and the submarine. While our unmanned systems cost pennies on a dollar, for a $100, or $100 million investment, we could buy 50 medium vehicles, which would be the equivalent of eight feet of an aircraft carrier. So it's very possible to scale very quickly with our unmanned systems. Yet we failed to make that critical pivot in our investment in this area. Why? Over the next couple minutes, I hope to pose some areas for you to explore, to think about, and hopefully to spark you to help us reach that critical tipping point for unmanned systems, just as naval aviation was able to do 100 years ago. The first is to expand our risk toler tolerance for research and development. We have struggled with risk and our understanding of a loss of a vehicle does not equal the loss of a manned platform. We have not pivoted in our research and development and we're falling woefully behind our adversaries. They are outpacing us in every level in this area. The next is to build a compelling capability worth continued investment. The reason I use compelling is because as long as we, use, we do things that are just interesting, we're not gonna move the needle uh, against you know, the capital assets, the carriers, the surface ships, and the submarines. Again, we have to compete in the political arena. We have to understand the politics that protect those capital assets. And again, we have to build a compelling case for Congress so they invest the money and the research dollars that are necessary to move this forward. We have to solve the most vexing problems for unmanned systems, right? We have to look at the navigation systems and we have to improve battery longevity, data management, common planning software, open architecture for payload integration, automatic variable ballast systems for the small and medium vehicles. 
We have to improve communications above and below the air-water interface. And those are just a few of the things, the complex problems that we're working on today. But finally, it comes down to our people. It comes down to having mavericks and people that can operate these machines. If you talk to anybody that operates these, they are not truly unmanned and uncrewed. Right now, there are teams of approximately 10 to 1 vehicle that are needed to operate these. But we also need mavericks in key places that can push this enterprise forward. Thank you.